In San Francisco, the mayor, the city council, labor leaders, business leaders all put their names on a full page ad, huge print, said wear a mask and save your life. Now the mask didn't do a damn bit of good. Now the mask didn't do a damn bit of good. But that is a very different message than this is ordinary influenza by another name. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who's someone who I just met a moment ago, but I really enjoyed his work over the years. John Barry is a best-selling author and historian. He's currently a distinguished uh, scholar at Tulane University, where he's focused very much on the fate of the uh, Gulf Coast. I came to know him from his book, Rising Tide, the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927, and how it changed America. He's also written a book entitled The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history, published in 2004. The Great Influenza was ranked by the National Academies of Sciences as that, as that year's uh, outstanding book on science um, and medicine. He's the only, he was the only non-scientist on a federal infectious disease board of experts. And he was on the team that developed non-pharmaceutical interventions to mitigate a pandemic. He's also advised both the Bush and Obama White House on pandemic preparedness. So with that, I'd like you to help me welcome John Barry to the podium. Thank you, and uh, thanks for coming, and thanks for putting together this uh, conference. I want to give you a very quick summary of what happened in 1918 and what we might learn from it. Uh, the estimates of the death toll start at 35 million and go to 100 million. Adjusted for population, that would be approximately 150 million to 400 million today. Uh, most of the dead were adults aged 20 to 50. Probably about between 3 to 8 percent of the entire population of people in those age groups died. In certain subgroups, it was worse than that. There were numerous studies of pregnant women uh, that had case mortality rates from 23 percent to 71 percent. In virgin populations, it was not unusual for 20 to 30 percent of the entire population to die. And although the focus has often been on the young adults who died, they are not the only people who died. Uh, look at children. Uh, even in the West, where case mortality was the lowest, the 1918 pandemic killed as many children aged 1 to 4 as today die of all causes over a 20-year period. It killed as many children aged 5 to 14 as die from all causes over a 10 to 15-year period. And remember that well over half the deaths occurred in a period of weeks, about 10 weeks in the fall of 1918. So just think of the impact uh, that would have. Today, even a non-lethal pandemic could sicken between 60 and 100 million Americans, 2 billion people worldwide. That would overwhelm the medical system, use up antibiotic stocks for secondary infections, destroy the timing of just-in-time inventories, devastate the economies. So we need to extract every lesson we can from 1918. And the first lesson is we need to put a lot more resources into vaccine research, particularly universal vaccine, but in the interim, improving technologies on vaccine manufacture. Second, to inform policy choices, we need to continue to study events therein. The virus itself, we continue to learn more about it, particularly Jeff Taubenberger, one, you, one of your speakers. It's epidemiology. Cecile Vaboud is in, certainly an expert there, another speaker. Uh, and we also need to look at it from an interdisciplinary perspective. I believe there is plenty to learn from 1918 still. Uh, I'll give you three examples of untouched data. I know of studies of several hundred thousand people in institutions uh, that relates directly to the effectiveness of hand washing, that data has not been touched. 
There is excellent data on quarantine uh, by a brilliant pioneer epidemiologist, uh, strongly, sug not just suggesting, I think, proving that quarantine is pretty useless in influenza. Uh, that's untouched. Maybe most important, I think there's data from the 1889 pandemic and from 1918 and from a recrudescence in 1920 uh, about the first person in a household uh, to become sick with the disease. I think that would certainly deepen and might challenge some of our understanding of how the disease spreads. But to me, the main lessons involve what today we call risk communication which happens to be a phrase I despise because it implies managing the truth. And I don't think you manage the truth. I think you tell the truth. In 1918, chiefly because of the war, but not entirely for that reason, uh, they did not tell the truth or close to it. Uh, the disease was known as Spanish flu, yet national public health leaders called it, quote, ordinary influenza by another name. The Surgeon General of the United States said, quote, you have nothing to fear if ordinary precautions are taken. And what was true nationally was also true locally. The false reassurances were almost everywhere. At Camp Pike, Arkansas, a doctor reported his hospital closed, overwhelmed, doctors and nurses dead, thousands of soldiers sick and dying in barracks, and miles of double rows of cots, he says, Everywhere, there is only death and destruction. Seven miles away in Little Rock, the newspaper reported, Spanish flu is plain the grip, same old fever and chills. Now, I think society is built on trust. And these false reassurances, these efforts to keep morale up, quickly led to a loss of trust and authority. It was alienating, deracinating, isolating, and as a result, society began to disintegrate. As one person said, the disease kept people apart. You had no school life, no church life. It completely destroyed all family and community life. People were afraid to kiss one another. They were afraid to eat with one another. It destroyed those contacts and destroyed the intimacy that existed amongst people. Uh, in Philadelphia, there was a doctor who lived 12 miles from his hospital. There were so few cars on the road as he went home every day, he started counting them. One day, on a drive of 12 miles, there was not a single other car on the road. He said the life of the city has almost stopped. On the other side of the world in New Zealand, another doctor stepped outside of his hospital and said, I stood in the middle of Wellington City at 2 o'clock on a weekday afternoon and there was not a soul to be seen. It was a city of the dead. There were people starving to death, not because there wasn't food, but because people were afraid to deliver food to them. Victor Vaughan, who had been the dean of the University of Michigan Medical School, a serious, sober person, not given to overstatement, said, if the present rate of acceleration continues for a few more weeks, civilization could dis disappear from the face of the earth. That's what happens when people lose trust in each other and in authority. And to test my hypothesis, or the hypothesis, that the truth does make a difference, there was one city that did tell the truth, and it was an entirely different experience. In San Francisco, the mayor, the city council, labor leaders, business leaders, all put their names on a full-page ad, huge print, said, wear a mask and save your life. Now, the mask didn't do a damn bit of good, but that is a very different message than this is ordinary influenza by another name. And in San Francisco, the city was extremely well organized. Certainly nobody starved to death. Blocks were well organized. Teachers, when schools closed, they volunteered as uh, orderlies, telephone operators, delivering things. The San Francisco paper said, one of the most thrilling episodes in the city's history was the story of how gallantly the city behaved during the epidemic. That's what happens when you do tell the truth. So I think the lesson is clear. Public compliance 
with recommendations will be difficult under any circumstances. Sustained compliance will be much more difficult. In Mexico City in 2009, for example, masks were recommended on public transit, free ones distributed, usage peaked at 65%, and four days later, it was down to 27%. So if we expect compliance with recommendations, authorities need to get out front and stay out front. They need to be totally accessible. They need to stay ahead of internet rumors. And the final lesson is not from 18, 1918, it's from 2009. Planning does not equal preparation. There was a lot of planning done between 2004 and 2009, but when that very mild pandemic hit, uh, it was as if, at least by authority figures, none of that made any difference. You look at irrational responses in China, Egypt, India, Britain, France, even some, to a lesser extent, the United States. And again, planning does not equal preparation, which means I think maybe the biggest challenge to the public health community is to get political leaders to make rational decisions in crisis situations. And that is where leadership in the public health community really matters. Thank you.